the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session for November 17th, 2021. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? Mr. Smith, pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointed employees over whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to negotiations and to perform an administrative function. Second. A motion second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. We'll be back at five o'clock. Thank you. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education for number the 17th. Can we all stand for the pledge? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, do we have uh, approval of the agenda? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Second. Uh, motion second. All those say aye. 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 aye 75 oh. Okay, for the approval of the minutes for November the 3rd, closed sessions. Have I had a chance to look at them? Yes. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the minutes for the closed session on November 3rd, 2021? Motion. Second. A motion second. All those present uh, say by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye have it. Okay, we now have the... Uh, the open minute sessions for November the 3rd. Has everybody had a chance to take a look at them? Yes. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the minutes of open session for November 3rd, 2021? Second. A motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, moving on to informational items, our COVID-19 numbers, metrics or whatever. Yes, um, President Smith, members of the board, you can see um, this is just the updated chart for you, for your information. Um, it looked like we were doing pretty good there for a little while, and now our numbers are obviously spiking back up. Um, we have not changed any of our mitigation strategies, um, nor our quarantine um, protocols. Um, so we're kind of just trying to do the very best we can to get those numbers back in line and bring them down. Because I saw we almost got down to the white, yeah. yellow. And then we did. Now we're mm -hmm. back up. We did. We were this close. <laughs> so I'm um, hoping that, you know, over the next couple of... Um, Thank you. And now we got Thanksgiving exciting. and Christmas. But I know. Hopefully, so we'll hopefully how, they can level off and everything. Hopefully it'll level off, yes. But we're keeping an eye on it every day. And... Um, you know, monitoring um, how many students and staff members are positive. That's on our website as well as we monitor how many students are quarantined and staff members for that matter as well. So we'll continue to use those good mitigation strategies and hope to see those numbers fall soon. Any board? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Just one is, have there any been in Queen Anne's County any deaths in anybody under 18 or anybody 19 to 29? I wouldn't know 19 to 29 and to my knowledge, I have not been notified of any students. And on the quarantine numbers, I don't even know if it's possible to do this, but is there a way to find out of the, like um, we had the last time I think the numbers and we're at 25 positive and then 75, I think it was, was quarantined. Uh, is there a way to track how many of those 75, if any, come down with symptoms or COVID? But the, it's on the discretion of the parent to let us know whether the student was tested and positive. So we don't necessarily right. have a very accurate, or we would be reporting that information. Great question, the state level is asked us the same thing um, and, and and looking at it from the information we do have to my knowledge it's been less than two percent and we've expressed that at the state level on several occasions that necessarily quarantine them is not resulting in students being positive okay great thank you mm -hmm. but there's still a state mandated that we have exactly to but, we're still but it's very the low CDC. the numbers as far as what we have right yes and, and again just like miss bennett said yes uh, last week we had about 25 positives through the district and that includes staff and students and we have uh, quarantined about 75. Great, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Virtual professional develop days. Ms. Hiddock. Mr. Smith, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. So what I am presenting to you is an informational item 
and um, the CNI team, along with the executive team, looked at the uh, current calendar and the professional development days. And what you see are each of the leveled, um, each of the levels of schools, and each of them has. Um, two and a half days allotted for virtual, an option, let me preface it with an option for teachers to um, receive professional development virtually. If the teacher chooses to be at the school, whether they like the structure of just being in their classroom in an office type environment, or if they need internet, they can certainly be at the school. Um, <coughs> If I, I can just go down through each one of them. So for elementary, December 3rd, there's half day for grading. So the teachers work on um, establishing their grades for the students. So that's something that they can work on from home. January 21st, it's a district PD. We have a lot of elementary school teachers. And right now having them in one location is challenging. So this supports that. Um, January 24th is a school-based PD. Um, middle school, same flavor, just days are altered with school-based versus district. Then the high school is slightly different with January 21st. That's a transition grading day because they're transitioning from one semester to the next. January 24th is a school-based PD. And then April 1st is when they do their half-day grading. So each of the levels receives two and a half days as optional virtual professional development or teacher work days. So <clears throat> the board might be wondering why are we doing this? Well, how did this come about? And um, essentially, um, Michael and I, or Dr. Noel and I meet with the union um, on a monthly basis and just talk about anything that we can do to help support our staff members. And um, I did receive an email following that that suggested, would we look into this because some other districts are doing that. So I investigated, I talked to some of my colleagues to see what, you know, what they were doing. And this is an effort to provide opportunities for teachers um, to support not only their mental well-being to give them a mental break but also to have options and choices as it relates to where they learn and what style is best for them so if they want to do their grade sitting at their classroom that's great if they want to do it in the planning area with several other colleagues that's fine or if they want to do it at home or wherever um, we, we are going to be supporting that and providing that opportunity and the same for professional development um, some may choose to stay some may be in their classroom doing professional development and some may choose to do it at home or in another place and we're just trying to support and provide those options for our staff members. I mean, if it helps the teachers, I understand that. If the principals find it, it's, it's not a burden. I mean, they still can get the same results of what they think need done in these days. Yeah, well, one thing with the last year and a half, it has taught us that we do have other ways of delivering um, professional development, having meetings with teachers. Um, Dr. Salins has met with principals at the beginning of the school year multiple times. Um, every Friday she was holding meetings and they didn't have to convene here, which is what we would have historically done. We met via Zoom. And it does allow us to deliver a message and have professional conversations, so. And the teachers association would likes it too. They find it, it gives them a break and some options. Uh... Well, I, 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 and that's kind of where it started. There are other counties that are offering it as well. Um, so it is, it is following a, a trend that is occurring, but it is looking at the mental health of where our professionals are currently and allowing them to have that mental break. And, and the expectation doesn't change. Teachers no. still have to have their grades in mm -hmm. at a given time period. Um, and they still are responsible for participating and engaging in that professional development. It's just how they're going about that. So, you know, on a grade day, honestly, a teacher could have done their grades in the evening, the night before, which many of our teachers do evening opportunities or weekend opportunities. Um, and they may plan ahead and get that done and take that opportunity to have a true mental break. So, um, so really it's, it's just trying to offer options and be flexible for our staff member to meet their needs. Yeah, 
it, like it's, it's, I appreciate the information. It's you know, it's good that we can do it when people can do it. Some some professionals can't do it. This Correct. this seemed to be so. Um, and it doesn't impact our students, right? Yeah, it's, students. it's, it's that's, really that's it's really an impact thing. on staff. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you know. I just just wanted to make sure that you yeah. had all that. Again, if you someone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, Dr. Matt Kibler, introduction of Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Dr. Kibler, the uh, presentation background looks wonderful. Thank you. I, <laughs> I had well to. Done. That, I had was, to, that was pretty fast. I'm I had impressed. to rush to edit this because I just didn't feel right having yeah, the. Uh, old I'm logo very impressed. There. <laughs> it looks very, very nice. Thank you for taking the time and yeah. effort to do that. Sure. Well, good evening, Mr. Smith, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team members. I'm here today. I just wanted to um, give an initial overview to the blueprint for Maryland's future that you uh, no doubt have heard about. Um, this is sort of a first introduction to the blueprint. You'll be hearing a lot more about it throughout the year and, and, and years actually as we go along. But uh, tonight I wanted to give everybody a little update on where it comes from, sort of what's in it and um, what we're doing so far to prepare to implement it. So a little bit of background first. Uh, the blueprint comes from a 2016 to 2019 Kerwin Commission study on innovation and excellence in education where the, uh, the commission was tasked with making recommendations to enable Maryland's pre-K to 12 school system to perform at the level of the best performing systems in the world. So this study did take multiple years. When it was concluded, it went to the state of Maryland and which was then turned into the blueprint for Maryland's future, House Bill 1300 in 2020, which was passed, but then vetoed by the governor that year. In 2021, the um, HB 1300 was overridden. An additional bill was brought forward, number 1372, um, which was also passed. It updated and complemented the initial legislation. So there were some dates that were not gonna be able to be met in the initial 1300, which got amended in 1372 and some clarifying pieces. So really the blueprint is a combination of these two bills. Um, it's a lot to go through. It's um, 240 pages in HB 1300 and another 45 in 1372, and we're doing the best we can um, to get the district ready for it. It's broken down into five policy areas, um, and I'll go into a little bit more depth in a few minutes on what's in each of these policy areas, but we have early childhood education, high quality and diverse teacher le teachers and leaders, college and career readiness pathways. And I wanna make sure that the board members understand that uh, career and, and technical education is in that policy area. More resources to ensure all students are successful. And then the governance and accountability piece of it. Current progress, what are we doing as a district already? Um, over the summer, before I even uh, got here, Dr. Salins organized a, a blueprint implementation advisory work group. I believe the, the group has met um, five or six times at this point, meet uh, monthly, and it's made up of stakeholders from around the district. We have teachers, admin, uh, school level administrators, uh, um, administrators from the central office, board members, Ms. Bennett and Mr. Smith were at our last meeting, which is great and hope you can continue being there with us. We have community members as well, parents, health department, um, uh, police and we're always looking to expand that group to make sure that voices around the community can be can be heard and, and have a part in what we're doing. I'm a member of a statewide blueprint coordinators group and we we meet with representatives from MSDE when, when necessary. Um, and basically we're talking, so we kind of, the districts are aligned in what's coming in the blueprint, make sure that um, 
all the districts are, are sort of progressing along in, in sort of the same way. It's a great resource that we can ask each other questions. We meet roughly every month. There are additional meetings if something pressing comes up and, and that's just been a great resource I think for all of us. I put affinity groups here just to sort of uh, let everybody know that the different areas um, sort of associated with MSDE are starting to tackle this, the early childhood education and, and their contacts at all the districts are really um, meeting and, and working on the pre-K piece, the CFO groups. I know Ms. Towers keeps me abreast of, of what's going on in their group through MSDE, so they're really ahead of the game. Dr. Noel and his HR colleagues are talking a lot about it. Dr. Salins, I think it's a, a weekly update from the state superintendent and there's a piece about the blueprint I feel like pretty much every week to, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So it's, it's a big, it's a big, um, big bill, but um, I appreciate that everybody's working together on it. Um, we really are focusing on the reporting requirements for this year. Uh, just so everybody understands, it's not that the blueprint is, is necessarily happening already where all the different policy areas are, are sort of are, um, already implemented, but there are a number of reports that we were required to submit this year. Most of them are just informational to the state, just sort of baseline data where we add on certain things. Um, Nothing really surprising. I think we've been able to handle everything just fine so far. We have we have all the dates and, and we're working on that. We had two due dates this week actually and, and, and we're fine and um, that, that'll continue. And then the big piece here, and this is where the Blueprint Implementation Advisory Work Group will play a, a large part as well, is our district-wide implementation plan. So how are we going to implement the entire blueprint in the district in the coming years? Um, and that's gonna be overseen by an accountability and implementation board that is appointed, appointed by the governor. They've just met for the first time. Um, so I'll go into a little bit about that, but the district implementation plan, um, the AIB will actually give us the guidelines for this plan. On February 15th, the rubric for the implementation plan is going to be developed by MSDE, and that's to be to us, to the districts by April 1st. And then our completed implementation plans are due back to the AIB by June 15th. We've, um, the AIB has just met initially. There are some um, discussions around that there's the potential that these due dates get shifted. Um, for they are, these dates are in the law. So until something gets amended in the law, I think as a district, we need to continue planning that, that this is, uh, you know, what we have to operate on. But uh, we're, we're keenly aware that this might shift a little bit. So a little bit of a breakdown about what's in all of the policy areas. And, and this is, I mean, you're talking, Early childhood education, I think I took 30 or 40 pages of the bill and broke it down into two bullet points. So there's obviously a lot more here, but just, you know, you know, the 30,000 foot uh, view. The early childhood education is looking at expanded full day pre-kindergarten for both three and four year olds. And it also includes increased standards for teachers and programs so that the pre-K uh, teachers are certified, uh, programs are accredited. And there's both a, pu a public and a private piece to this as, as well. Uh, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. The, the goal of this piece of the legislation is to track individuals to the teaching profession. There is a career ladder piece, which has both a teacher track and a leadership track. And the goal is to not only attract people to the teaching profession, but then to incentivize and give room to grow as teachers. There is another piece as well where um, districts can develop leaders, both up to the principal level, and then if we would choose to add a, a piece of that to district level leadership, we can do that as well. 
college and career readiness pathways. It's really about increasing the attainment of college and career readiness, um, a competitive college preparatory program, dual enrollment. And so what they're really looking at here is, is not just, it's, it's your AP classes, it's getting students um, in the dual enrollment to maybe get an associate's degree by the time they graduate. And then as well, expanding the access and, and the number of students that are um, completing CTE programs. And I know I think we've heard a little bit about that in the past few board meetings from Mr. Tolley as well. More resources to ensure all students are successful. So it includes academic, social service, and health supports. Uh, this can include things like tutoring, as well as mental health resources. Uh, and increased funding for special education and EL students, as well as um, expanded funding for technology. And then the last piece is the governance. So overseeing the implementation, again, of, of the blueprint in all the districts is this accountability and implementation board, the seven, seven member board appointed by the governor. They have rotating, um, rotating terms on that board and they have a staff that will work with them. We have to make our comprehensive implementation plan and there are also going to be expert review teams within the blueprint that will be visiting the districts, looking at our plans in action, making sure we're doing the things that, um, that we said. Next steps, where are we going from here? Um, continuing to get the word out to stakeholders. I'll be making a similar presentation to the administrator and supervisor group in the beginning of December. I'm, I'm anxious to hear that group's uh, thoughts on how, how else we might get the, the word out to, to the teachers in the schools, parents, community members. I attended a liaison meeting with the county commissioners where we talked a little bit about what uh, the presentation here. They had some questions about the um, accountability and implementation board and what we had heard um, from our end that the governor appointed. And, and so they know and they, they've invited us back to make a presentation at one of their schedules scheduled meetings to get the word out to the community. I'm really interested in seeing what we're already doing in the district um, that satisfies the blueprint. It, not everything that's in it is new. Some of it, we're already there. And I think the more we can see that and, and assure ourselves that, that we're on the right path, it, it's going to feel good. Policy area subcommittees, it's really difficult for the advisory work group who only meets once a month to you know, fully work on this plan by themselves. So what we've started to do is we've got a, um, initially right now, we've got a pre-K group that's going to be meeting um, every other week. Uh, we're starting to meet as well on the career ladder piece with a small group of folks and that will expand as we go. Uh, also met on the college career readiness and the CTE piece and, and we'll just keep expanding that um, as we go along. And, and, and then, then the last piece is just preparing our district to write the implementation plan and uh, we'll watch the dates. We'll see what gets amended. Um, in this in this next legislative session, uh, we'll have a we'll have an eye on that, and that's what I prepared. I'm happy to answer any questions, and, and I might take questions and come back to you because uh, <laughs> again, there's a lot here. Well, two two things. Uh, I just happen to be in the building, so I stopped in. Helen's our representative on the board there, but my question is on early childhood education. Who's going to fund it? <laughs> Where are we going to put them? Um, and I don't, you know, I'm sure, and you know, it's, we got a space issue, funding. It's all great to do this, and very impressed with your panel who you have there. But everybody's got to be there. You know, got to make sure we you know, get all the stakeholders because. You know, this is, it's, it's like a contractor's plan with, with zoning. I mean, it's, it's where it starts, and, mm -hmm. and this is where the foundation is. And if we, don't, if we get it right here, what happens here is what's going to be the future. Don't get involved now. People better, better pay attention. And that's, that's one of my concerns just on that one. Um, you know, uh, well, we Helen Pollock. We talked about that with the right. Kerwin, when it was the Kerwin. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a great in theory, but how do you fund all of that? Mm -hmm. um, that's, well, theoretically, that's the money from the state 
So and what, what about built, uh, but the facilities? That we, you know, right now we we know that some of our schools we can ex actually expand and do it, but some we can, and so we have to really start. You know, what does that look like? How do we provide that spacing? Um, or looking at it from a district perspective, do you pull those together in a different location type of thing? So those are all you know things that we're all talking about and thinking about and investigating and talking to other districts, see what they're doing and things like that. So we're just in the process. Of I'm impressed with the just the brainstorming going on. I mean, some great ideas, and uh, I think that it's exciting to just see all of those sure. wheels turning and. and coming up with thanks yeah. I appreciate that we've got a good group and we'll continue to expand like mr. Smith said to make sure we don't leave anybody out mm -hmm. um, mr. Pender is a part of the, the pre-k group because obviously the space is an issue transportation um, the you know there is a there is a private uh, d piece of that pre-k three to four if, if private providers would like to step up uh, they they would have access to that money and we could partner with them as well so we'll continue to explore options the nice thing is we don't have to flip a switch and do all of this next year I mean right. that, that's not the <laughs> point right <laughs> right I mean we have years to implement this and, and implement it um, a as we can um, and, and those are some of the decisions we'll have to make uh, you know do we do we choose to, to try to you know go full day for just four-year-olds first and, and see how that goes I, I don't I don't know but those those are all the, the discussions that have to take place and where do we put everyone mm -hmm. well, history it has always told us that most mandates come with us with no money that's mm -hmm. correct I mean I think you know be diligent like you know raise these questions not that I mean the state's gonna do what they're gonna do and it sounds fun that mandates come down all the time but it's, as Helen says, we need to be aware of some of the stuff that's going on. Sure. Because uh, you know, a lot of these stakeholders, some of them at this thing are, big, are gonna be the ones being asked to fund it later on. That's correct. And it, the, so like I mentioned, there are some discussions about with the implementation plan, will those dates for the plan get shifted, shifted back? What has not been discussed yet that I've heard is, how about the other dates to implement like the career ladder specifically, will that get pushed back? We don't we don't know yet. It ha it did get pushed back once when the original bill was was vetoed and then overridden, but we don't that that remains to be seen with what happens in the, the legislative session this this uh, coming year. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. I'd like to Tammy add one thing to the agenda. Ugh. <laughs> What do you need? I forgot to introduce Sharon Brett, our new uh, board thank member. You. Uh, I, I should have done this earlier. That's why I don't get paid the big bucks. But uh, I want to uh, thank you for volunteering. You've been appointed by the governor for District 1. Thank you. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, I think a few of us, all of us that could make it where it's your swearing in. That's where it's blue thing. Uh, I really appreciate you being on board. Thanks. And I think uh, welcome. you're well aware of our system because I think you telling me you have a daughter that just went through the system. Yeah. So, uh, bring a lot, of, a lot of knowledge and uh, first-hand information to us. I will try. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thank welcome. you very much. Okay. Now we're back to our agenda. <laughs> Fun balance, Jane. All right. Good evening, Dr. Salem, President Smith, board members, executive team. Tonight we bring before you for a first informational review of a first read of a fund balance policy, policy 310. The purpose of this policy is to uh, establish a targeted fund balance for the general fund of our unassigned fund balance and guidance with the use of fund balance, how to actually use what that fund balance will be for going forward. In the policy, the target range, I'll bring it up, it's on page two, would be a minimum of 1% of our annual operating expenditures, not to exceed 5%. I, I apologize, on here it says 305, is it 310? Because even on the fund balance policy, it says policy 305. Can somebody just clarify if it's on the, three? On the, on the, on the oh, yeah. It says 305 or 310. Can somebody just clarify before it goes out? Yes, definitely we will. Good catch, Tammy. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm look at this 100 times and we still not, you know. You know, I, 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 get it. Appreciate I appreciate that. Eyes. Yes, thank our eyes you. get crossed after a while. And I understand that there other um, there's other counties that have this policy already. Pretty much all the school systems in the state now have, it's okay. either a percentage or actually a, a dollar amount. Okay. Well, 
it's, it's physically Very responsible to have. I mean, you, you can't, you have to have some kind of fund balance because you never know what's going to happen. And there'll be no regulations attached to this? It would be just straight policy? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think you know five E is the big one. There's percentages, but then the other stuff mm -hmm. read through, and you know, I, I think it's due diligence to have that in a, in a manner because things can happen. And in, in addition, when you think about um, to the, in addition to the emergencies, we also have to prepay for a grant as well, and we get we pay up front and then get reimbursed the next month. So there's a timing issue, cash flow issue there too as well that we have to take in consideration each month when we pay our bills too. You were you were telling me like when a grant comes in, let's say a million dollar grant, we might already have to we have to forward fund that. It will come in 30 or 90 days later. Correct. But it's mm -hmm. money that we've you know used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does any board members have any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, current action item, Dr. Salins. Yes, and Dr. Um, Mr. Smith, members of the board, I bring before you an action item um, to modify our current school calendar. Um, this request includes five current full days moving to half days, and those dates are listed in the action item, which are December 22nd, March 4th, March 18th, April 14th, and May 27th. And the statement or reasoning behind this request is over the last 20 months, um, we've definitely had to navigate some um, significant situations. And as a result, um, I know everyone has been working extremely hard to plan and implement and engage students in learning. And coming back, face-to-face -face instruction has been most beneficial for our students, um, but also has been very overwhelming for the staff, not having that opportunity midweek to, um, to take extra time to plan. So the half days would provide them, meaning our, our staff, um, with opportunities to kind of digest and catch up and or rest. Um, and these, these days really are to promote self-care and the acknowledgement that the social and emotional well-being of our staff is important and significant. And um, I wanted to make sure that the board knew that we are still well within our um, requirements of the state. Um, total hours that are mandated by the state is 1,080 hours um, and also a requirement of 180 days. We will still meet that requirement and you can see the numbers there that elementary and middle school hours are currently slated at 1,223, um, a total of 143 hours over and the high school are currently 164 hours over. So we would still be well within and would not jeopardize meeting the state requirements. Okay. Um, do we want to get a motion in a second or do we want a discussion first? Uh, point of information, Mr. Smith, uh, I would like to have a discussion first okay. because we're not sure exactly where to go and I don't want to entertain a motion that's going to be frivolous. So, okay. you want to start it off? I don't, sir. I don't, I don't have I, an answer right now. I can totally understand um, what Dr. Sablins is saying and, and this, the spirit and, and all of that that this has been brought forth. My just my concern is if this was a public document that received public comment from the from the parents and teachers and community. And so to change it after they, um, now whether or not we would get public comment, I have no idea, but without the opportunity to give them an, um, a chance to speak about it, um, there is some hesitancy on my part. Well, my opinion is we have 15 half days in this calendar now. I think, and I agree with Dr. Salins and mental health and all this, but there's a, you know, you can make that for teachers, you can make that for firefighters. Like we, we can go all over the board on that. Um, and it's been tough. It's been tough with the COVID and what the teachers have to go through. Mm -hmm. But we've had 15 half days. I'm not a fan of half days. I think you bring the kids in. I think our students need more in than that. Um, the schedule's been set. Parents have made certain uh, things for it. I mean, it's hard on everybody. And I understand this. And I think just 
just earlier, we've made some uh, work with, I think Mrs. Hudak sat there and said, we're gonna try to work some virtual stuff with our teachers. And I sympathize, it's a tough job, mm -hmm. it's, it, it is. But I am not for adding any more half days to this calendar, personally. So these half days are, it's my understanding they're right before holidays begin, right? So they're three of them all three are, out of the December 22nd is the day that, that before our Christmas, our winter break, I should say. Right. Um, the two March dates are not, they would be new. And then the April 14th is the day before spring break and May 27th is the day before Memorial Day. So three out of the five are the day before a holiday shift transition. Right. And there's always a decrease in student attendance on those days. There as Absolutely. well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I understand the philosophy behind it as well. And uh, but I do think I have to agree with Helen. I think that stakeholders should have an opportunity to look at the new schedule and to comment on it before we take a vote. I don't know if that was Miss Harper's motivation, but it is. Uh, I think it's a consideration, and we don't need to change this ASAP, right? Obviously, we want to do it as soon as possible. Well, December is. Well, yeah, the December yeah. one just concerns me because parents would have to make you know, would have to make right. accommodations. Oh, this is coming up. Okay. Yeah, All yeah, right. and that's, that's why we didn't one. include the Thanksgiving because that's obviously next week. So um, originally we had put that on there and said, oh, well, that really doesn't give parents much time to kind of plan for you know that shift right. or change okay. of daycare. Yeah, so that's coming up soon. I have no objection to the days before the holidays. I don't agree with doing it in March because we already have a half day. There is already a half day listed uh, March 11th. I, I, I think it'd be a, bur a burden on the parents for the 4th and the 18th on either side. I, the day before a holiday, uh, you know, vacation starts, I don't think any parents, well, some will have hardship for uh, daycare. Um, but again, giving a half day before the full days off, uh, I, I don't have a problem with those three days. I agree. Those three days are, most kids are gonna probably be out anyway, um, but the two in March, not necessarily a fan. I, I don't know how many kids, I mean, we really try to make kids in school and, you know, we, we I don't think we're gonna, do, punt and say kids take off a half a day they're supposed to be there and parents have made that commitment to have those students there if they're not there it's just like our staff and other people taking vacation days when you're not there um, like I said I, I think we have enough half days in this schedule already I, I you know I think there's other ways we can hopefully help our teachers but they're not the only ones suffering in this, in, this, in this pandemic. Just speaking um, anecdotally for myself, as a single mom, you would have changed that schedule on my sons. I would have been scrambling to find some, you know, because I can't take days off. I need to work to get money to support my family. So, and without the stakeholder input, I just have a real problem with it, because it's been said, and we're talking about changing it less than a month before the first day. Um, but I understand this, but I understand I'm not taking away from, I'm not saying that the reasoning behind it is not sound, um, but I'd still not be in favor of that half day. The only thing, I mean, <laughs> from the mood I got, I'm probably not gonna be the one on the, the side I wanna be, but stakeholders, you know, we have to make some decisions. Right. And I, I respect Dr. Salen's putting this together. If it's gonna change, which I'm not for it, better change it now than push it farther because it's just gonna push it a, a, a cone closer for everybody to have to start scrambling for daycare mm -hmm. and everything else. Mr. Well, Smith, could always drop December Mr. Smith, could we possibly put it on the website and get some feedback before we do this? I mean, we do have December 1st meeting. If we are putting it out now that we are considering doing a half day on December 22nd, that would give people time to have some input. Two weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's possible, but we would have to put this out. I mean, like total mega blast, you know, through the parent portal, you know, emails out to, you know, the entire staff, how they would feel about having a, a half day on December 22nd. I have no problem with that, but it's probably not gonna change my mind, but I'm, I'm willing to listen to anybody, but I'm, I'm for mm -hmm. leaving account, account like this, but there's five of us up here. So everybody's got, let's come up with a consensus on that one. So do we make a motion to? We just direct Dr. Salins to put it out on the website. That's all. 
what's, what's and then put what? it on the agenda for December the next 1st. meeting. And we put it on the agenda for December 1st. And what's a December, what's a half day in December again, please? December 22nd. So we'd make a decision on the first, yes, and it would affect the twenty second, which would give them would give somebody three weeks, four, three and a half weeks to make arrangements, knowing their child will not be in school a full day. But we really need to put this out as an e-blast now, like tomorrow morning. This is what the board is considering. Okay. We need to have parent, parental, and teacher input. You know, staff input. Mm -hmm. Are they available? Are they? You know, can they find? You know, child care on December 22nd. Would some of them like to have a half day off? You know, it's. We need to be fair about this. Let me ask you a question. Or maybe this is something. We talk about students. That maybe I'm not putting you on a hot spot, Amy. Just punt if you want to, or don't say anything. <laughs> As a principal. Some students probably don't show up on, a ha on the day before Christmas or day before Thanksgiving holiday. What about your staff and teachers? Do you have a problem with that too? It, it just depends. It, it really does. Just It okay. just depends. But as I had said previously, I, I think that the teachers, knowing that they had the half, the second half of the day off, would be more apt to be in attendance. So we don't have attendance problem before holidays or anything? I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay, thank you. It just depends. Understand. It just depends. And we already have a substitute problem, so yeah. it's... And now it's very different than... I guess, yeah. Dr. So. Salins, could, would it be feasible to take this, I mean, you're hearing what the board's saying. Sure, absolutely. Uh, to put this on the agenda for our December 1st meeting yep. and take a vote on it with everybody knowing that there's been a proposal by you, there's been some suggestions on a couple different days and let people comment on it and uh, get back to it or get back to. So I can put out a survey tomorrow to everyone, staff and parents, and I can actually list it out by date so we can get data for each mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. okay. So if it's like everybody says yes for the 22nd, but like only half of people say yes for April 14th or, right. you know what I mean? So then you can actually see, because somebody brought up the fact that the three days before the holidays might might actually be advantageous for yes. parents who are traveling or something like that where the student wouldn't miss work right. and so I can actually do it by date and give you some data by date okay that's great. great that sounds okay. good yeah, awesome. thank you so what we're gonna do is I have uh, we're gonna table this until our December 1st so do I make a motion to table the discussion uh, and vote uh, of this uh, of the half days until December 1st is that a motion motion have a second. That's a second. All those favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Our next thing. Future meetings. We have, as we just discussed, December the 1st, board meeting. Um, I have been asked about December the 15th, and I'll defer that in the next to the ne December 1st meeting to Dr. Salins if we need a work session for December. I know there's a lot going on in December. Okay. Um, if we, I'll, I'll if look it on. You and I'll get can, to you. you know, yep, if, sure. if the board feels, any board members feel that they think it's necessary, we'll keep it on the 15th. If it's not a hot item for that, we could tentatively look at that. So long as we let the, let the public know that we're not having a meeting on December 15th, we can vote on that on December 1st. Yeah, sure. It really comes down to what kind of action items are needed by the end of the month, if there's any emergency procurement um, you know, pieces that need to be done. Um, that, that's one of that's yeah. the, the, the board feels we need to meet, we meet. If Dr. Salins feels we do, we'll meet. Sure. We'll just collaboratively work together on that and decide it on the first. Absolutely. Okay. Do we have any other uh, things for the calls? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you.